Hope everybody had a wonderful couple of days of relaxation and eating. It's always good at this time of year. And as Chris does most of the time, he assigns a theme. Some people follow it, some people don't. And that's fine. You may read whatever you've brought. I'll start off with one that does not relate to those themes, which I've lost because I just got one of those new flip phones, and they set it up yesterday, and I didn't have time to really go in and do everything I needed, so it's taking me a while <laughs> to figure it out. Okay, there we go. <clears throat> I have one called Miami Beach Adventure, number one. An old-fashioned in one hand, a cigarette in the other. Aunt Blanche, she of throaty voice and salty language, was connected through her boyfriend, owner of racehorses and businesses unmentioned. How exotic she seemed to us, cousins who listened in to adult talk. Her living in Miami was exciting enough, with tales of nightclubs and fancy dinners at places that reeked of lavish excess of the 50s and 60s. <clears throat> the decadence of fancy parties, cocktail dresses, furs, and jewelry gifted by her lover, whose wife, of course, stayed home with the children. Money flowed like storm runoff down hurricane-ravaged streets. She often spoke of Joe's and the Forge, where the beautiful people gathered for dinner, and some second-floor casino action. Blanche was very fond of gambling and being with celebs, entertainers, and made men. In the 80s, I was at a state meeting at the Fontainebleau. Someone mentioned the Forge, and I had to go. We pulled up to the building, which had no signage. Car was whisked away by a valet, and we entered opulence. Art, antiques, and the shiny brass monkey bar. Dinner was like any other upscale steakhouse. <coughs> Our wallets substantially lighter, we headed to the bar and danced the hours away as night slid into morning. Aunt Blanche would be so proud. Okay, I'm going to call the names in the order in which they appear on this sheet. So the first one is Richard. Is it Lepre? Lepre. Thank you. Yeah, that was a beautiful poem. Love that. Um, I didn't realize my um, poems had a theme of their own today until I was writing them, but um, as I was going through old stuff as a one-time philosophy and uh, writing major, um, I used to read a lot of stories like Beowulf and things like that, and um, I would write a lot about the myth and that experience. So this poem is called Mythos. I'm settling down. Salt from the rim finds a new home. Tales of ascent and descent, so cliffhanger. You're left nailless by the credits, hopeful by the happily ever after. Thank you. Um, this uh, next one is um, about me reading all these old poems and realizing they have a kind of specific tone. You know, as someone who is interested in a lot of science fiction, um, all the quote-unquote good science fiction is essentially about nuclear war. Um, so this is kind of with that thought in mind. Margaritaville plays over the din of nuclear winter. All the good sci-fi has a bomb as the bad guy, a big boy in a trench coat, playing henchman to a superpower. 
Not that I think about it much anymore. I only write to-do lists. Rarely do I have time to dwell on the grocery list of yesteryear and what future archaeologists will make of my workload. Thank you. Um, I'm from New Jersey, and um, when, when you're from, yeah, who isn't, you know? Hello, my brothers and sisters. Um, you have to pick a city. You're either from New York, New Jersey, or uh, Philadelphia, New Jersey. I'm a little more on the New York side of things, but I always think of New York as like uh, someone you're jealous of, but um, you know you love and respect. And um, when I think about big world issues like the aforementioned nuclear war, or you know, just the normal old wars. You know, I, it makes me want to have, you know, just like a temper tantrum because it's frustrating. You don't know if you should post about it on social media or, you know, go to a city hall meeting or vote every now and then. So this poem's um, kind of an ode to that as a longtime hot-headed New Jerseyan. It's called Rather Large Apple. Another song about New York City makes you want to go there and own it. Sing about it while being there, owning the Big Apple. I'll get pizza and sit at a coffee shop and visit Joe and talk shit. Anarchist shit sipping $6 coffee, black. You got to ride the subway and visit the museum like you did when you were five or six. Those kids kept hogging the computers and it bummed me out. I might see a play. I'll do a lot of walking and writing and talking. And people will be there. Plenty of people will be there in New York City. New York makes you want to scream. Get button balls naked and scream. In the middle of Times Square. Button balls naked. Screaming brown noise. A mother in baby blue calls 911. I'm playing one of those rock and roll Star Spangled Banners. My father always said, Given enough money, he'd rent a helicopter and pee over New York City. Thank you. Thank you all. Appreciate it. This is Christy Sheffield Sanford. Okay, thank you. Well, I go to the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship, and so the speaker today was talking about talking to nature, and that reminded me I wrote a book about how to talk to a river when I was living about two blocks from the St. John's. So, um, of course, you can't talk to a river, but uh, <laughs> okay. So I thought I would try to get the language right. <laughs> How to talk to a river, a string of pearls, P-U-R-L-S. Words hang in three dimensions. Words stagger in air, occupy a matrix. Words dapple longitude and latitude. They drop into the river. Some sink, others stutter to the surface. Little lispy gasp, so happy to see you. Why don't you drown me? Dip me in the water, baptize my cursives, my Helvetic ascenders. Ring me out, see the bleed? There goes my maroon glacé, purpuring the surface. Words wrap the knee of a cypress tree. This water can be traversed on foot. If you don't mind some yards submerged, some totally exposed, wear your nudity well. Uh, thank you. <laughs> this is kind of like a rock. There is really no end to this, so it just goes on. But uh, this is another little excerpt. I lift the river from its bed, brush away sand that clings, wrap the liquid mantle around my shoulders. Behind me flows the twisting body and tail of a Chinese dragon. My fingertips gather in the meander, trailing gown, threatening to trip me up. Tributaries of pulsing, uneven fringe escape. Max Ernst's mustachioed man in suit leans back in a stuffed chair, blissfully adrift in a storm. A swimmer's arm juts from the water, ready to execute a stroke. 
floating down the Nile. Cleopatra lounges on a chaise propped on one elbow. She surveys the scene. Her bark passes the seated man. She waves in her Greco-Egyptian way. Oh, thank you. Michael Henry Lee. You're next. Isn't it nice and warm today? Yeah, that's what I, everybody's got an opinion. That's what's, what's great about life. We always still can, can voice one. In consideration, well, I'm Michael Henry Lee. I'm a Japanese poetry stylist. Some of you know me, some of you don't. Uh, some of you don't want to know me, apparently. <laughs> Natalie is one of them. Uh, she'll love this one. In consideration of today's theme of Thanksgiving, I've opted to read other people's poetry. So you won't be subjected to mine. That might be a plus. Um, but seriously, uh, I've chose to read a, several haiku poets that have really have passed and have had a profound effect on my psyche, my writing style, etc. So let's get her going here. In the prison graveyard, just as he was in life, convict 14302. In the prison graveyard, just as he was in life, Convict 14302. That was by Johnny Bernanski, uh, who passed in 2018. Speaking to us, the empty chair at the poetry reading. Speaking to us, the empty chair at the poetry reading. Uh, that was by Carlos Colon, AKA Haiku Elvis, who passed in 2016. Much weaker now, drawers still full of a former self. Much weaker now, drawers still full of a former self. By Rachel Sutcliffe, who passed in 2019. Autumn chill, a butterfly swept up with the leaves. Autumn chill, a butterfly swept up with the leaves. Cindy Zakowitz, who passed in 2012. Rumors of a war. Up into a darkening sky, a child's newsprint kite. Rumors of war. Up into a darkening sky, a child's newsprint kite. By Angelia Diodar, who passed in 2018. Fishing where my brother stood. Twilight chill. Fishing Where My Brother Stood, Twilight Chill, by H. Jean Murtha, who passed in 2015. Drowsy, My Death Poem Can Wait. Drowsy, My Death Poem Can Wait. That was by Bill Kinney, who just passed in 2022, this last year, or in September of this year. I'm trying to remember, it was kind of eerie his last poem, and I can't remember it, so I'm not going to try to, to butcher it, but it was pretty eerie. Then the la his last poem that was published in a, a renowned uh, haiku journal. I'll close with one for Mr. Weaver. It doesn't do him justice, but I'll give it my best shot. Leonid's shower. One shooting star outshines the rest. Leonid's shower. One shooting star outshines the rest. Thank you very much. Peace. And we have Natalie next. Natalie Beltrami. Hi, guys. Um, I want to start by uh, doing a little quick ad. Uh, on uh, the 3rd, December 3rd, we are doing a, a fundraiser at the Limelight for Hopeful Handbags. It's for 
victims of uh, domestic abuse. We're doing it at two and at seven. So please come if you can. I'm also in it. Yes, yes, she is, and does a terrific job. All right. Best friends wrote it. <laughs> and I love that last poem by how prophetic or how, rel I mean, he was a shiny, he was a shooting star, so to speak. All right. This is kind of my old standby, so you may have heard it before. Thanksgiving. We unfold great grandma's hand embroidered, hand embroidered napkins, reclaimed from an ancient buffet for their yearly outing, along with our religious platitudes, both musty from disuse. Heads bowed, words of thanks slip quickly from our mouths, unhampered by conviction, and nestle in the cranberry relish, a sweet condiment to make the meal more palatable. We've gathered again because the date is circled on the calendar. Tradition demands fulfillment and seems somehow fitting. Again, a tenuous piece disguised in ceremonial garb. It's emissary a turkey stuffed with misgivings. Another group of virtual strangers, unfamiliar with the other's language, dutifully saying lines learned from sermons and saccharine sitcoms. Can we remember them from last year? We pass across the table a plate of obligatory How's it, how is is, garnished with a general helping of you've never looked betters and offer a smattering of, oh, I'm so sorry, it's on the side. Auntie brings her bow an onion dish, her latest bow who drinks too much and can't remember names. Thank God our printout from ancestry.com is tucked in a convenient pocket of our fading memory. The children are old enough now to sit with the adults and to wish that Alice B. Tolkis had made the pumpkin pie instead of Grandma. No need for them to connect except to a convenient outlet for their cell phones. The rest of us sit at a holiday table, puzzle players, turning our pieces this way and that, searching for a fit. The picture seems the picture seems more boche than Bruegel. We try to keep our smiling masks from soiling as we choke on our empty cliches and overcooked turkeys. After dinner, the women seek refuge in the kitchen and trade health histories amidst a clatter of dirty dishes. The men feign intimacy, sharing a communion of Irish win whiskey and first downs under a rattle of car keys, uh, excuse me, until a rattle of car keys signal their release from fa family bondage. Thanks are uttered silently, but now with conviction as we head for home, vowing to make reservations for next Thanksgiving in Tokyo. <laughs> This is, um, I don't know, this is a little too, okay. This is another one that you may remember. This is called Talking Turkey. Oh, this on this lovely autumn morning, you snatched me from my bed. Without a bit of foreplay, you really turned my head. You took me and you stripped me of my, all my pretty feathers, as naked as a girl could be, despite the chilly weather. But then you must have read my mind, wherever it had gone. You took me to the kitchen and turned the oven on. Then you got quite kinky and slathered me with butter. You also bound my ankles. I should have minded mother. Of men and aprons with tall hats, she warned me to be beware. She said you'd get me really hot and make me think you cared. She said you would, that you would take my heart 
my liver, <laughs> liver, neck, and gizzard too, and stuff me full of promises of things that you would do. You'd make a, frivol make a fr famous star of me, and I'd be center stage. You'd shower me with rich perfume, thyme, margarine, and sage. You'd promise me a party to mark my grand debut, with lots of big celebrities and fancy French wine, too. You'd reassure me I would be the best dressed at the table, despite the fact that ladies would be wearing mink and sable. But since I'd lost my head, I really couldn't think it through. And trusted you and what you said, I didn't have a clue. The dinner, dinner would be catered, you told me, I would see. That I'd be on the cutting edge. And I was, literally. I gave my all to this affair. Of that there was no doubt. I must admit you didn't lie about my coming out. I am the focus of the feast, a star for all to see. And everyone is giving thanks, everyone but me. <laughs> I don't know what this next name is. Is it Millie? Uh, OK. Wasn't sure if those were L's or something else. It ended up looking like a Roman numeral, too. <laughs> All right, this is my first time here, and I haven't been in front of an audience in a long time, so <laughs> bear with me. All right. This one is for the artists. From the belly of the beast, we come marching to the beat, pounding pavement, creating subsonic frequencies. We hum melodies, chants, mantras, speaking a new tongue, a new meditation, bruised hands from tapping out rim shot rhythms and beating our war drums. The prophets and wise men warned you through many seasons, even more moons, that we were coming. A new warrior arises, burning like the grandfather fire a fierce passion. We are the flames held by frigid palms, piloting through the night, no starlit sky. Wearing feathers, beads, and bones, these locks symbolize loyalties made long ago. And we cease at nothing, rode into your life by way of visions and words. We align so that they might see where, uh, well, this one is for the sorrows of those who lie their souls upon these stages in a final attempt to make you listen. Where was your faith before now? They wrote their lives away, locked behind doors of determination, swore there would be more time, more turquoise skies, more life. Gripping, dripping pens, telling stories of things seen in the shadows. Hear, listen, know. We are the soldiers left to tell the tale, legends who fight the silence and oh. How we'll burn like the grandfather fire a fierce passion and a new warrior arises. Thank you. This is the beginning of my husband and mine's love story. It's called Seish. I prayed for rain. It was a pilgrimage to the edge of the earth, hoping the birds might turn around and fly north for one last favor. But they said it was too late. So it must have been the ocean that delivered my message because you came riding cyclones over great seas to answer my siren songs. Suddenly, high-speed winds steer in different directions. Blue fades to gray skies, and with the night, you brought the southern hurricane season. 
Your words fell upon me like raindrops. The more you'd speak, the heavier my dress got. I walked into your storm. The steady rhythm of your voice poured over me in sheets and baby, my streets are flooding. Twisters roll off silver tongues of young lovers, drunk on conversation. Tidal waves and waves and waves wash over me and I can't seem to keep from drowning in your cadence. Harbors cannot hold. Levees overflow with amorous poems spoken by lips, interrupted with a kiss. Bayous become big rolling rivers flowing by like rapids. We stood strong, oblivious to any consequence the future holds for us. Time stands still as you and I are at the eye of the storm, as one and one become a tsunami of love. And I just have one more um, that I'll share. This one is called The Stoning. My fingers are stained by this nicotine I cannot abstain from. My addiction to his love is like indulging the sacraments. This is my season of confession, penance, and for it, they wanted to burn me at the stake. They said I was a witch. I was just sent with a God-given gift, a message. But I, too, am only human. I am only one woman to glorify this kingdom, this throne. And still, they wanted to stone me. They wanted to burn me at the stake for love's sake, for God's sake. They tighten the ropes without knowing I speak the truth. My face might be black and blue, but my spirit goes unbruised. My conviction is not to be judged by you. So I sing songs of redemption. I spit poetry on mics before the masses. Before the wars and the massive attacks, I will not be silent. My voice is loud when it needs to be, but right now, I am quiet. Until the time comes that we riot, full force will write it and take hold of our amendment of free speech. And we sing and we teach, even through the stonings, even though I know they will burn me at the stake for love's sake, for God's sake. Thank you. Mill, you are now a member of Ancient City Poets. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> Shut up. Okay. This first poem is called Small Boats. We are salt, we are water. We carry brine through tributaries and feel the tides surge to the brain, the fingertips, the toes. I've read that the moon is inching away and that the earth's spin is slowing, as are the tides. Yet clams in the Ohio River continue to feel them, as do plants whose inner oceans, like ours, respond to the moon's gravity. And here, sitting by your side, I worry that the rivers within you are rushing too quickly to the sea. Worry that someday, standing on shore, I'll lose sight of you in the small boat of your body. I lay a hand on your wrist, feel your skin afloat above muscle and bone, and know that what sustains us is water. These waters on which we've gambled everything in such frail canoes. Thank you. Um, this next one, um, I went to, I attended online an, an Ah Abad 
workshop. And Abad is a poem to the morning that's often with regret of leaving a lover or something in the evening. And, um, but this particular, it was wonderful. She gave us several examples of different kinds of Obads. But she wanted us to think about something, uh, you know, a traumatic time in our life. So this is kind of a leaving from the darkness and going to the light. And you will hear me say a bod in here, but in that case, I mean a body woman. It just kind of is a reflection of the fact that it's an abad. Um, and also, she wanted us to use uh, a, a word that could be used a couple different ways that chimed against each other that you could hear. So I used the word altar, alter, A L T E R, and alter, A L T A R. Okay. Abad without regret. You expected a penitent kneeling at the altar of you. Instead, you got a bod whose sin was to alter your belief in your infallibility. Got instead one who struck communion aside, pushed your hands into her sex, intoning, blessed be this, my blood, who said, wash your own damn feet, who strode through the dark chancel of your hypocrisy, lifted her skirt, and confessed herself into the light. Thank you. Chris Castle. Chris with a C, Castle with a K. <laughs> it beat me to it. I couldn't say it. Well, I thought I'd share with you a poem that I wrote yesterday afternoon um, at the North Florida Poetry Hub. We do that on Zoom several times a month. And the prompt was, we only had a little time left, so instead of having a 10-minute prompt, we had an 8-minute prompt. And we were supposed to write about the things you were not supposed to talk about at the Thanksgiving table. Oh. Shutta wrote, I just, a, 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 someday you're going to have to read that for other, that's just amazing. Anyway, this is called Thanksgiving Request. Don't turn on the TV to watch the big game. Don't talk about football or its great hall of fame. I don't want to hear it again and again. I've heard it before and it all sounds the same. Don't count all the votes that never were cast. Don't insist that your politics are the ones that will last. Stop being a disruptive iconoclast. The election is over, it's all in the past. Tell old family stories, I like them the best, about how Uncle George hid the flowers under his vest, or Aunt Martha's first plane flight and all of the rest. Give thanks for their memories with which we've been blessed. And uh, I'm gonna come up a little bit with this, there we go, I think. There, I think it's in place now. And if you'll indulge me, I'm going to do an autumn song, which is also based, of course, on poetry. I'll just hold it here. Don't worry about it. When it's golden in the meadow and amber in the field, it's time to reap the bounty that this good earth can yield. It's time to gather in the grain and pick the apples sweet and celebrate good fortune that make our lives complete. Shall we all dance round together now? Shall we all dance hand in hand? Shall we dance along the waterways? Shall we dance upon the land? Oh, the wind smells much of autumn, and the frost is coming soon. The birds are flying southward beneath the harvest moon. See the leaves sport merry colors as the days grow shorter still. Let us join in happy chorus and eat and drink our fill. Shall we all dance round together now? Shall we all dance hand in hand? Shall we dance along the waterways? Shall we dance upon the land? 
Shall we raise our glasses to the sky? Shall our feet rest ever on the ground? Shall we toast each other one by one? Shall we then be homeward bound? Let us all dance round together now. Let us all dance hand in hand. Let us dance along the waterways. Let us dance upon the land. Um, Anya? No, it's Annie. Oh, it looks like IA. Okay, so truth be told, Annie Kianaga, hello. Um, I was um, inspired to write something this morning. I had a poem on gratitude that I wrote a few years ago, but I've been contemplating gratitude. So this particular piece is a contemplation on gratitude. It will involve some audience participation if you are available for that, if you're moved to do that. Um, it's a bit of a meditation, you could say. So a contemplation on gratitude. And it sounds a little negative at the beginning, but it really isn't. I mean, life can be difficult sometimes. Just thought I'd say that. OK. How to feel gratitude when life might present great difficulty? Deep, deeply sorrowful loss. Obstacles of seemingly enormous proportions. Life as a human is not always a bed of roses. And that's putting it mildly. So where can gratitude be found if these come your way? In the grief, in the hardship, in the feeling of loneliness and possible ensuing isolation that might arise. It can only be discovered in the now, in the golden now. So take a moment and close your eyes. Close your eyes if you could. And sit up straight, I might add. I'm a yoga teacher. Uh, notice the movement of your breath. Keep it, let the simplicity of the moment be with you. And as you do this, and let there just be a moment of silence here, feel that inner silence arise. As you sit in this indwelling silence, scan your own life. Scan all the myriad ways you are actually being met with support, with comfort, with love. Raging from the chair you are sitting on, feel gratitude for that basic support. To the earth that holds that chair, to the open window that, that greets you with a breeze, and the cup of coffee that warms to the glistening leaves that adorn your outer world on a sunny day, followed by rainfall that replenishes, and to the plate that offers a nourishing array of edibles born of this sunlight and rainfall, to the cooling water that a glass holds for your hydration, to the gentle smile of a stranger, and the creative opportunity poem writing offers as well as the time available to participate in such. Not everybody has that time. Take a moment and acknowledge the enormous variety of ways care and generosity have been there for you, even since waking up this morning. So at this moment, I'd just like you to go back to when you woke up this morning and start noticing all the ways you were supported. Maybe your bed was comfortable and your pillow was nice. Maybe your shower felt great. Maybe somebody you love called you. I mean, they can be very subtle. They range from very subtle to very obvious. Acknowledge these things. And then I go on to say the beauty that perhaps was found in a floral display greeting you. I have orchids. Or the delight of a bounding creature, a family canine that let you know in no uncertain terms that you are adored. I thought maybe Amy would be here, so I put that in. The list is almost infinite 
Observe and recognize in each moment all the ways your existence is held and met with love. And allow the flow of gratitude to fill your being. Be grateful for this opportunity of a human life you've been given and how and bow to the abundance therein as well as bow to that of which you have been spared. We don't know what that is, but we've been spared of much. Oops, hold on, I just lost my page. I'm grateful for that, hold on. Bow to it all. You know, actually I meant to, after that little meditation, I was gonna ask for you all to share whatever arose. So you have that opportunity now. Did anybody have anything come up that kind of surprised them that they were thankful for? What would that be? My bed. Your bed! <laughs> Some people don't have a bed. Anybody else? I mean, it can be really simple, like opening the refrigerator. Yeah. The last piece of leftover pumpkin pie. <laughs> there you go. There you go. And the fact that we're breathing and alive, right? That's part of it. Uh, it can be hearing a bird. Anybody else like to share? Oh, come on, guys. You've had lots happen. What's that? Well, share one. What's that? Yeah, and you have nice sunglasses, too. Very cool. All right, let me just open this up. I'm almost at the end here. And for that, you can be grateful. Ride the currents of this buoyant yet profound gratitude and let it fill you with ease. Oh, ease is wonderful. Feel its deeply healing nectar and be thankful. That's it. So it, it, it is true that I think our brains have the proclivity to notice what's lost rather than what's available. We tend to hold on to maybe the negative more than the positive. So this particular gratitude practice can be very powerful in shifting one's perception of life because there's so much, like the universe is actually has our back. It might not seem that way. But once you start noticing these things, you know that's true. Okay, I'm just gonna share a very short haiku and that's it. It was written Thursday morning on Thanksgiving. Thursday morning haiku. Sitting on this earth, Soft gratitude arises. Go home to yourself. Thank you. I don't have a piece of paper. It's uh, confined to the cellular realm for now. Uh, I also must concede I did not write to the theme. I apologize. Uh, but if it's any consolation, I only have the one sonnet. So uh, this is Thoughts on Birch Trees. I find the poem hardest at its start. It is the summer leaf on autumn trees, but leaf subsides to leaf and word tears thought apart. But the poem's a log that fights the freeze, the ember of thought that turns to fire, without whom I curl up a babe, hands round my knees. Though the poem's the thing which I admire, the forest so dark and deep that I could, when venturing in now, pour both my awe and ire. No, the poem's the birch among the wood, that speckled silver column which has led me through dark where I lose all sense of bad and good. Yet now I can't find the poem. It's quickly fled, lost amongst the birches, a sprouting from my head. Wow. Don't we have some great work today? <clears throat> Lynn. Good afternoon. I'm really enjoying being with all of you today. Um, I've never done this before, so I'm starting small. <laughs> um, 
I'm really grateful for a friend who brought poetry into my life. And the other day, he sent me a haiku. So I thought, well, I'll give this a little try. So this is my challenge. <laughs> it's about, um, you know, every day we have small successes and failures. And perhaps there's even one in this moment. Fly in kitchen lands. One moment's effort wasted. Recipe fulfilled. <laughs> Loretta Lido. Yeah, wow, you know, we've been eating all this food and now all these words are feeding my soul, doesn't it? <laughs> so I'm going to do a shameless promotion too. We are, um, I'm with Pam Jam, poets, artists, and musicians spreading joy. Almost half this room has participated in it. And it started in 2020 when we took 18 ancient city poets and we paired them with 18 artists from Butterfield Garage Art Gallery and we brought in local musicians. And it, it was going to be a live show and then, you know, the pandemic hit and, and really in a way it helped Pam Jam because what we we had a pivot and we created videos instead and now those videos live forever on the on the Pam Jam website in a virtual gallery and I went on to do Ponte Vedra and Jacksonville and there's now 44 videos out there. We've had over 100 participants with Ponte Vedra and Jacksonville. We were actually able to raise money for um, Title I schools, both the art programs in Jacksonville and the Sound Connections program for Ponte Vedra. In May, we did May Day for Moms, and we've collected handbags for Hopeful Handbags. And actually, Tony Libro hooked up with Kathleen Miner there and said, you know, I got this play <laughs> that I'm, I want to do, and that's that they're doing that on, on um, Saturday. So, um, Wednesday night here at from 6 to 8 o'clock, um, one of the inspirations for Pam Jam was Anna Miller when she asked um, poets to write poetry based on her artwork called Refractions. And when I listened to it, I was like, yeah, let's do it the other way around. And, you know, I've raised money for all these things. We, we also did breast cancer. Um, uh, what was the other one? The river, the, the boat people, <laughs> the, the litter getter. So, um, now Anna needs help, and so Pam Jam's coming full circle, and we're going to do a fundraiser here. There's already a bunch of poets, artists, and musicians who are raising money to help her with her native Ukraine. She's a local artist, but she's from Ukraine. A medal from um, Zelensky and stuff, but for and uh, we're going to have Annie Kianaga, Natalie Beltrami, Sherry Little, and Christy Sanford. We're going to be showing their videos as well as we're going to do a tribute to Lee Weaver and show um, the eyes have it. So if you can come, all the money, Pam Jam takes no money. I've, I've spent a good deal of my own money on Pam Jam. We don't take anything. Um, it's all going uh, to Ukraine. So I'm going to read a poem that I dug out from 2006. And it's in 2007 when I was um, pushing 50 and I was taking yoga classes. With, and, and this, the, I met most of you all through Ancient City Poets. I actually met Annie Kianaga in yoga class. And I was going through a very difficult time during this time. Um, I was, you know, changed a life. <laughs> I, I rushed from work to yoga, try to namaste, namaste, <laughs> rush back, you know. So, <laughs> and um, I gave it to, D to Didier, and he says, you know, my wife writes poetry. And that's how Annie and I met. But um, it, it was me moaning about growing old. And this was 15 years ago, and I'm kind of glad I didn't take my own advice. Um, it's called Wrinkles. In yoga class, I do the plow swinging back my legs, throwing my heart higher than my head, meditating for a rare moment, hearing healing Hindu harmonies. But then my eyes open to see wrinkles on my knees, 
and I try not to cry, but I do. So my yogi says, don't think about the past, don't worry about the future, live only in the moment. Then I try desperate, desperately hard in downward facing dog to focus on my form. And with each sun salutation, breathing deep breaths of more life into my lungs. But then I gaze in the mirror to see wrinkles round my eyes. And I try not to cry, but I do. So my yogi says, this is not your body. You're only borrowing it. Your body will die, but your spirit will live on. Then I wonder why I care so much about my body. I feed it, and I wash it, and I powder it, and I perfume it, and I massage it with hot oils and lotions, shave it, tan it, exercise it, examine it, and caress it in every way. But what am I doing for my soul? At the end of class, I sit cross-legged in lotus, trying with a blank mind to overcome the fear of time. Then I bring palms together, bow my head and pray namaste to see wrinkles on my hands. And I try not to cry, but I do. Then I plead, oh Lord, let me not grow old. <laughs> Very honest. And here's another short one that I wrote. What's that? <laughs> I, I tried to use his French accent. I'm not very good with the French accent. But he did say all those things while, while I'm sitting there going, okay, let me have a blank mind, and you know, everything's racing through my mind. Okay, this one's called Time Watch. Each time I look at my watch, it's turned, hiding its fleeting face from my eyes, only seeing broken glass, weathered leather, time worn on my wrist, my hands, feet and face, knees, eyes, means no more hiding from the truth that time has been worn and possibly time to throw my watch away. <laughs> Jenna, Abel, Abel, which um, um, can you bring the mic down here? Sure. And I apologize for what your ears may suffer through, but I think you'll enjoy it. Um, so this one does not have a title. We will survive, I think. After all, we'll raise gardens, eat soup at long tables, sing to our children and grandparents. The waters flood higher, the fires rise out of the ground, but somewhere in the world, a young tree grows. Bread is warm from the oven. A group of small girls play a skipping game on the broken asphalt. Much is lost, and we weep. But not all, not yet. Even the last sunrise is still a sunrise. Thank you. Um, and this one, is called Good Old Boys, and it's after a poem by, uh, I believe, our Nat Nobel Prize winning poet laureate Ada Limon. Um, and she wrote a poem about uh, the ways in which the men in her life love, and the ways in which uh, she has noticed that the people she cares about express love. And so I wanted to write a poem this one is about my father and my grandfather uh, and the ways that they express love as men. Uh, one moment, please. Here it is. OK. <clears throat> Last week, I had oral surgery. And my father drove me home, got out the glass baking pans, said, baby, you want some cornbread? I figure it's soft and crumbly, and I'll put lots of butter in it so you can eat it easy. And I sat in the kitchen as he poured the mix, stirred the batter, thinking to myself, what sort of a princess am I to deserve cornbread homemade by her daddy's hands? And this is the second companion verse. My grandfather answers the phone. Hey, sugar. Three syllables honey poured down the phone line. How you doing? 
His smile cracks the surface of his words like an orange peel in a baby's mouth. I was just fixing to call you. What you been up to? I'm so glad to hear that, baby. I'm so proud of you. That does your old granddaddy's heart good. I took Grandma to lunch today, first time in two years. She was happy to get out the house. I was thinking I'd come and spend some time with you on Sunday if you've got room in your schedule. Thank you. Did I do the voice right? Yeah, no, that was, that, that sounds like granddad, yeah. Yeah, okay, good. Um, so yeah, she's my sister, and I'm uh, Bryce Adel. It's nice to meet you guys. Um, I've actually never read at an open mic before, so I go easy on me. But, um, yeah, no, I'm wearing the sunglasses. Yeah, no, I've got to hide the eyes, but... Uh, I'm gonna just read two or three poems. I, I didn't know there was a theme. I found out about this on Instagram, so I didn't know there was a theme. But it turns out all three of my poems kind of like go with the thankful theme. One of them definitely does. So we'll just get into that real quick. Um, the first one I wanted to read, I grew up here and I've lived in this area pretty much my whole life. Um, and I was driving on I-95 in like March of this year. So super rainy, thunderstorms every afternoon. And I'm driving home from work uh, and the highway's packed, but overhead, sky's super gray, lightning, all that. And uh, so I was paying attention to the storm. And just for a split second, like I was sitting in traffic looking at the storm and then we start driving again. And I look in front of me, there's a truck, maybe like two cars ahead, um, and a cat falls out of the back of the truck. And I just like watched it fall out of the truck and then disappear it, wherever it went. Um, and we were going fast, maybe like 50 miles an hour. So I was so struck by seeing that, that even though there was a storm and even though it was like wet and crazy and I wanted to get, get home, uh, I pulled over on the side of the highway and wrote this poem because I just had to like get it down. I almost didn't believe that I saw it. So I had to get this written down. Um, and so this poem is called The Dancing Cat. Driving rain, I-95. Lightning low in the sky. Just a second, in the air, the black and white fur, a thrashing blur as it leaves the open window, and leers with green eyes seeing and seeing, the thunderous sky spinning and spinning, striking the concrete and streaming in many directions, a wet thing, vanishes beneath wheels and is gone. So, that was one. Yeah. I I, I saw that, and I was like, you know, w WTF, right? Yeah. That's a weird thing. But uh, I was in Germany recently, and uh, I was in Munich for Oktoberfest. And uh, for those of you, lots of beer, lots of fun. Um, but for those of you that don't know, Munich is very close to Dachau, which is where the first uh, German concentration camp was built during the war. And um, even though I was having fun and like getting drunk every day, I decided to take a couple hours out of the second day that I was there and go visit because I thought I'd be doing myself a disservice if I didn't go and see the, these things that I'd read about my whole life. Um, and it went as I expected. I was pretty much in tears by the end of it. But um, this poem is about uh, something I saw while I was walking around in the concentration camp. Um, this is called De Chao. In the precisely sculpted corners of a concrete creek, with long grass flowing like living hair in the current, a thirsty fly has landed and noticed is swallowed in a small splash by the golden flashing mouth of the waiting trout, who returns at once to his rock to float behind for the next fly. There is the chimney nearby. Oh, wow. Yeah, so it was, it was uh, I mean, a worthwhile experience. I think everybody should go and see one of those places. Yeah, at least, yeah. Yeah, yeah, which was the first one built. Um, yeah, I, I think everyone should see those at least once in their lives, especially young people, because the generation that experienced that tragedy is, is going away. Um, and so it's more important now than ever to physically see the place. I mean, you don't get it until you're there. But um, on, on a lighter note, this last poem uh, is 
on par with the theme about thankfulness. Uh, about a year ago, I was living in Jacksonville going to school, and uh, in my apartment, I had a patio that was about maybe five feet by four feet, just a concrete block, um, and then all the other houses in the neighborhood. And uh, I put plants out on it and a little teeny fence that I bought at Walmart just to like make it spruce it up a little bit, which attracted birds and lizards and all kinds of stuff. And I was sitting in my living room looking out the patio door at this patio and just was overcome with like how happy I was to be alive. I don't know why. I was just, what I was seeing through the window, I was like, this is, you know, it's the little stuff. This is the stuff of life. Um, and uh, I felt that feeling again recently, so I thought I'd read this poem for you guys. Um, it's called Patio Door. Look at the little lizard, abreast of his fence post, scales aglow, shining warm in this September sunlight. Over his head are gaylardia and marigolds, magnificent, leaves spread on high, deep in the oak canopies. The layers of a little earth, so bright, so basic, expressing the emotion of this still morning. A mud dauber hovers in the foreground, scenting the pollen which is everywhere. Beyond her, in another yard, blades turn under a lawnmower, and the hum is everywhere. Where is church, if not here? Where is God, if not this little porch? To live is so sweet. To live is so sweet. That's all. Oh, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you, Bryce. <laughs> okay. And welcome to Ancient City Poets. We hope to see more of you. Okay, Mr. Salcedo. Is it Isai? Yeah. Okay. Uh, not unlike one of the poets that came before, uh, I do read a couple of myths, uh, just ever so often. This one is a poem based on Sisyphus. I saw your name rise from the empty flames, like a phoenix reborn escaping its doom, carrying the weight of the universe upon itself. For motoring itself could not repel the flames, and yet brighter today, drowning in the shadows of yesterday, and giving the life of tomorrow. Your name is born once again, to be called upon, to reign the unending change, the vestige of what was, the possibility of what will be, and the foundations of what is. Movement is evergreen within history. It is your name, all myth, the one that shall forever be called to explain. It is your name, old and dead, that shall do as it may. Oop. <laughs> what was said to you, what was said for it to quell, but not the flames or the horror, but the brightness, the brightness and beautiful sorrow. For Sisyphus, more than a myth, Sisyphus is a man of free will and free action. Thank you. Paul. And after Paul is Tony. How you doing? My name is Paul. I'm the president here and was one of the co-founders. We've been around since 2011. Very honored to, uh, to have a home for all the poets, artists, and musicians here. And I'm sure uh, you know, as well as, uh, as well as Chris does, that you'll always have a home here. Good luck in your new digs at the Waterworks. I'm sure that'll work out great. I'll be there. Um, anyways, the, Continuing the theme about giving thanks um, about a poet past. Um, this uh, was one, his name is Daniel Thompson. He was a poet laureate of Cuyahoga County, which was my uh, hometown and birthplace of Cleveland, Ohio. And uh, he was a civil rights activist, like I said, poet laureate. He also started, and this is in the very same vein as Pam Jam, um, a thing called Junk Stock back in the late 70s and early 80s that I collaborated on with him. Basically, there was this junkyard on the west side of Cleveland, and a bunch of artists, poets, and musicians made a stage out of like a bunch of crushed cars and junk and everything else, and probably put together an annual event that became like sort of the first what you would call now poetry slams. And uh, it was very interesting. And uh, anyways, um, this one poem 
in particular from him was inspired, uh, like I said, he was a civil rights activist. So this is one of the times he was in a, he was arrested, put in a holding cell. Um, and this was inspired by a young lady. He was there that was being assessed. Um, and uh, so this is, uh, would you write a poem about me? And this is for Marlene. Would you write a poem about me? I like music, death, numbers, and jewelry. I'm gonna write books, the first one about love, the second one about my life, because it's very interesting. One night, I composed a two million word declaration of Negro rights, but I couldn't write it down because I didn't have a light bulb. Sure wish I had a light bulb that night. You'd have really liked it. I can write good love letters. They might be mushy, but they mean a whole lot. I do things the way I feel. You know, they wanted to give me $500 just to dance nude. Shh, I bought four copies of that record. I don't have one for myself. You know, they tried to kill me. You want to marry me? I mean, you want to be my boyfriend? Yes or no? You know how to dance? You want me to teach you? I like Italian men, mostly. <laughs> Don't put all that in there. It's personal. Well, give me a light. What sign do you think I was born under? What are you, Aquarius? Aries? I'm Libra. The scale's balanced. <laughs> Anyways, I'm leaving tomorrow. I'm supposed to have my senses back. You know what took 14 men to lock me up last time? They said I bit off the supervisor's nose. They'll tell lies on you. How do you say I love you in English? Will you live with me? We can have everything. I'm on welfare. Do you write in shorthand? I can't read it. I'll have to give you a lesson on how to write. Come here for a second. Good night. Call me tomorrow. I'll be free as a bird. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. This is really great. I'm having a great time today hearing everything, all, all your wonderful works, poems, comments. And I must say, Annie, when I got up this morning, uh, I went to bed with an inner ear rumbling. And the first thing I wanted to know when I woke up is it's still there. And it was. <laughs> but during the course of the day, it subsided. And I don't hear it now, so I'm happy. <laughs> so yeah. The first thing I want to tell you about is a play that's going to take place on Saturday night, December the 3rd. And it's called The Paisley Princess. And you're going to have to come and see it to figure out why it's called The Paisley Princess, Breaking Out of Bounds. And we have two actresses here who will, you will see starring in this play on Saturday night. So if you don't have your tickets, get them right away because you want to see Jenna and you want to see Natalie in The Paisley Princess. And I, you want to hear beautiful words. Oh, thank you so much. When, when did you write the script originally? It was in the very early 90s that it was first produced. Yes. Mm -hmm. So... Um, it, unfortunately, it is, yes. And this is a benefit for Hopeful Handbags Global, assisting survivors of domestic abuse and their children. And I have a lot of these in the back, so you can pick it up. It's got the link for the tickets. Where are the tickets so, at the Limelight Theater. Mm -hmm. So we'll see you all at the Limelight Theater on Saturday night or Sunday after, or Saturday afternoon, 2 o'clock or 7 o'clock whichever one you like the best, <laughs> or go to both. <laughs> OK, today I'm going to read a couple of poems that I've never read before that are pretty new. And I'm going to call them like um, Thanksgiving for the past, Thanksgiving for the future. So let's do the past first. This is called Smoke Rings. And um, I should mention that some of you might be familiar with a sonnet by Percy Bysshe Shelley called Ozymandias. It's about a desert where there's nothing there but these pillars. That's all that's left. And so playing off of that, there was this gas station, this Shell gas station. That all that was left were like the pillars <laughs> and maybe a, precursor of what's to come, who knows. But anyway, this is called Smoke Rings. Just the shell of a shell gas station remains a modern day 
Osmandius, two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Close your eyes and you'll see the cars pulling up to fill their tanks. Petrol, both plentiful and reasonable, perhaps 29 cents a gallon, more or less. Here they come, the Chevy Impalas, the Ford Fairlanes, its famous stainless steel stripe separating the two-tone paint job, aqua blue and white, low tail fins, white walls, polished chrome, sleek exotic creatures purring at the pump. Even a white T-bird slips into view. Music pours from the staticky AM radio, a mix of the platters, the drifters, the twilights. A rabbit's foot or fuzzy pink dice dangle from the rear view mirror. The driver lights a lucky strike, blows smoke rings out the window. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare. <laughs> we'll take you back in time. <laughs> and, and, and so this second one is called uh, Serendipity at the Supermarket. Today I met a woman named Theodosia. I said to her, what a lovely name you have. She was arranging baked goods on the table in the supermarket where she worked. Yes, she smiled, thanking me for the compliment. It was my grandmother's name, Theodosia. When I asked if she was sometimes called Theo, she said mm -hmm. more often she was called Dosia. When my grandmother was alive, she said, we were known as the two Dosias. She was Dosia and I was Dosio, while patting the maple walnut coffee cake into place. I made no mention of its Greek origins or its meaning divine or God's gift or the song Dear Theodosia from Hamilton or the martyred Saint Theodosia, but left musing on finding Theodosia here, busy among the sordid baked goods name embroidered in pink on her uniform with a sprinkling of powder on her nose. <laughs> Love that name. Yeah, I was so happy to meet her. And just one more little Thanksgiving Tonka poem. It's a five line poem taking two more lines than the, than the haiku. Sunrise services, a flock of white ibis rise together, our Thanksgiving morning prayer over the marshes. Thank you all very much. <laughs> Last call, anybody else? Wonderful afternoon, talented people. It's great to see some new faces and to hear some new voices. <clears throat> the last Sunday of every month, sign up is at 2.30, readings at 3, and we will be at the Waterworks, which is next to the library, the main library downtown. Starting in January. Next month, Sunday is Christmas. Yes. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If you'd like to help out, we're a little nonprofit. Uh, our studio, um, you know, full of local artists. Please like us on social media under the artist.